Good morning and uh, welcome to the November 27, 2012 Peer Insight. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is optimizing infrastructure for analytics-driven real-time decision-making. Um, just a couple of reminders before we get started. Uh, if you're not speaking, please mute your line. You can press star six to mute and then if you have a question, you can press star six to unmute. This call is being recorded. Uh, for those of you who are tweeting, uh, please use the hashtag Wikibon, W-I-K-I-B-O-N. Also, we are stri uh, streaming live on SiliconAngle.tv, SiliconAngle TV. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's it for the intros. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Doug Leoden, who, who is co-founder and CTO of Tapid, who is joining us um, if you are watching live on Silicon Angle TV, you will see him live streaming. He's Skyping in from New York today. Is that right, Doug? Welcome. That's correct. Thank you. Great. Thanks for being with us. Um, also um, dialing in uh, from the airport is Jeff Kelly. Uh, he'll be on mute except when he's asking questions or providing insight, so we won't get too much background. Uh, but Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you. And um, here in the studio with me is Dave Vellante, who's a co-founder and one percenter here at uh, Wikibon. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. And David Floyer's on, as well as uh, Bert Lattimore and uh, the Wikibon community. So, uh, so Dag, again, thanks for joining us today. Um, we are going to talk about analytics real-time decision-making and you've got an interesting environment there. For those people who aren't familiar with Tapid, could you just give uh, uh, a brief background on, uh, on uh, what Tapid does, and then we'll get into the discussion on the infrastructure that you're using there. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. So um, from a very, very high uh, level, um, Tapid is an advertising technology company. Um, what we do is that we, we uh, give advertisers um, the ability to look at individual consumers as they move across multiple devices. So we're able to do what uh, we call personalized advertising um, for users or consumers based on the behavior that we observe on multiple devices. So um, a user, a typical consumer user these days uh, is using multiple devices to access, in, access internet services. So they might have a, a tablet and a phone and a laptop and or maybe a set-top box, a gaming console, or a TV. And for most, uh, for most ad tech companies, uh, those devices will be uh, presenting a very fragmented view of the user, whereas we try to give a more um, holistic perspective on how a single user is uh, accessing services across the different devices. Um, and uh, we work with, with publishers and advertisers, so we enable that publishers to sell, um, for instance, uh, audience information if they have specific um, uh, behavior associated with users that are visiting their, their um, laptop or regular web environments, and we might be able to help them um, leverage that data and sell it on, on other devices um, later. So. Um we talk about real-time decision making. How real-time is real-time? How fa how long do you have to make a decision? So all of all of uh, or, or most ad tech uh, decision making these days are based on um, real-time uh, based bidding, which basically means that as the ad impression is being served, that's the only time and place you know exactly which user you're looking at, and you have to make a decision on which ad and which campaign you want to to show to a specific user as the, the page is rendering, basically. So um, the time frame um, from, from page load until the ad has to be uh, shown to the user is typically somewhere below 100 milliseconds. Otherwise, uh, the user will see that as lag. So, so from the time that the, the, page is, the page load begins until uh, the whole chain of decision making has been made and the ad is being actually served, uh, you have about 100 milliseconds. And in the ad tech world, I mean, the, the ad that you serve up is dependent upon the user device. It's dependent upon what you know about the user. Yeah, exactly. So um, 
it's all about the information um, that we have about um, the device or, or the user, and and those can be simple things such as um, uh, which what kind of site are they on, um, what the, what's their geographic location, and, and such things. But it's also uh, in these days more about data that we know um, based on previous behaviors. So let's say that we have seen um, a device associated with this device that has visited a, a site about cars, uh, and we have an auto vendor that is running a campaign with us, then we might uh, take a look at the device, see, okay, this, this device has actually visited um, a site about cars, and that makes the expectation of the value of this particular ad impression higher for this auto, um, auto advertiser. Um, so it's, it's about taking a look at all the data that we have available about the specific device and also the devices associated with that device. And all this is, of course, something that needs to be stored um, for, for retrieval very, very quickly. Um, and just in terms of volumes, um, ad tech, um, we, we, we have a lot of, of ad units and ad views uh, flowing through the system at all times. Um, and they're all very small requests but they're data-driven, and they're in the range of, well, uh, I know there are companies that are even bigger than, or much bigger than us as well, but we're, we're looking at about 150,000 ad units per second at peak time. So, and all of these decisions are actually data-driven. So it's, um, it's an interesting scaling um, challenge. So, so you've got information, uh, you're, you're making 150,000 decisions a second, right? We're actually making way more than that because each individual advertiser campaign that is running in our system will need to make their own decision about uh, the, the specific uh, ad impression that's coming in. So the, there, there is an, an increase there in, in terms of a thousand. So you, you, you were, we're talking about millions and millions of decisions, but uh, the decisions are made based on the same data. So for each request that we see, we will typically make uh, approximately two lookups in our data stores uh, to see to find all the information we have about that individual uh, device. Okay, so you you've already sort of profiled the individuals. You've just, this is a this is a person that that might be interested in this kind of thing, and when they come online, then you uh, or when they make a request, then you 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 pop up. Yeah, I, I would be cautious to use the word profile, but um, if, okay. if we have seen the device interacting with sites that have signals that statistically indicate that the user will be more um, propensive to 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 um, buy a product, then we will we will make a decision. Okay. So I can have to close the door here in just a second. Well edited. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's it's uh, to us it's very important to to. Um, debunk some of the privacy myths also uh, regarding the ad space and uh, um, we try to use less <laughs> inflammatory words that's just one of the one part of it, it but it's uh, it's definitely not user yeah, profiling it's all about statistics right okay um, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about the infrastructure because you you uh, when you were building make, making the decisions regarding the infrastructure for tapid you must have looked at a variety of uh, sort of back-end databases that that you might that, that you might deploy for uh, for your infrastructure. What did you look at, and what did you rule out right away? Yeah, tell us about the tech behind all this magic. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's it's long, long, uh, big, big topic. But um, when you're looking at the kinds of data sizes, uh, the, the amount of data we need to store. Um, the, the latency uh, and throughput required from a storage solution like this, and also the access pattern um, of a data storage solution. That's what you kind of start, need to take into account when you start looking at, at, at the data storage solutions. Um, and I am, I am not uh, part of that camp that, that now will apply these new NoSQL solutions to, to any problem that I see, um, but to us, it, Came, uh, became pretty quickly apparent that, that like regular solutions would would probably not cut it. And I guess we could have made uh, traditional relational databases work somehow, uh, but they have a lot of features that we don't need. So the access pattern for our, our system is very straightforward. We, we have an identifier associated with each device that we see, and we need to, to read a little 
binary blob, um, which contains the information we have about the device. We need to reread that on every single request. And then when we, whenever we see something or we serve an ad or something like that, we need to update it. So it's a very, very straightforward put and get uh, access pattern. So this um, lends itself very nicely to uh, a key value store. So in, in NoSQL, there are a lot of different types of data stores these days, and they range from from um, column-oriented stores to document stores, and then you have, uh, there are many kinds, but the, the most simplistic ones are the, just the pure key value stores um, that, that just basically support querying um, and updating single IDs. Um, and um, uh, we looked at a variety of solutions for that. Um, we looked at a variety of deployment solutions for that, so in terms of infrastructure. Um, and um, we, um, I don't know how much detail you should go into right now, but um, well, basically with key value stores, um, scaling them typically requires a lot of RAM. So uh, storing, storing values in RAM is pretty straightforward. It's very, very high performance, um, and it's uh, uh, generally <laughs> very fast. The problem is that uh, in our case, we're storing uh, in excess of a billion uh, devices, and we have quite a bit of information about each of them, so maybe a kilobyte or so of data, so we very quickly, and if we include the keys, we very quickly end up in, in the terabyte um, range. And a terabyte of RAM is still something that is very um, expensive. What, what's, a ter what's a terabyte of RAM cost? Ballpark. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I would have to I would have to Google that and check the prices for that right now. Um, right. But if you if you are if you're looking at server class hardware um, with a terabyte, that's going to put you down several tens of thousand. Um, of course, one server wouldn't wouldn't be enough anyway. So um, you would need to look at multiple servers. And there's another problem with 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 the RAM, and it's not not just about cost, but it's also about the, the time it takes to bootstrap something. So if you if you need to boot a new server, uh, to put it into the cluster, and and um, uh, a restore will require you to read a terabyte of data from rotational drives into RAM, and that's going to take you a lot of time. Of course, if you do, if you have your servers, your, your storage parti partitioned, maybe over uh, six or ten servers, so the the amount of data that needs to be read is way less. But it's still going to it's still going to take a lot of time. In either case, storage, um, such as in our case, we ended up using SSDs, is, is still, I mean, SSDs are expensive, but they're way less expensive than RAM. And you can easily um, put uh, half a terabyte or a terabyte of SSD storage in a server without breaking the bank completely. What, what SSD storage are you using? Um, so we're using um, one, well, let's see, uh, are these? I, I, I'm actually not sure about the make that we ended up on. I think we're running IBM mm -hmm. um, SSD drives. Um, the, the difference um, between, well, there's basically there are two different, very different classes of SSD storage. Uh, you have the consumer grade and you have the enterprise grade, and uh, there is still significant difference between these two types of, of drives, and it's about the fact that, that SSDs actually have uh, read-write fatigue, or I don't know what the technical expression for it is, but it actually wears out. So as you use your, your SSDs, the, the flash RAM will actually decay and become um, less useful and lower performance. Um, so you have, to, you have to get the more expensive kind, but it's still, compared to uh, RAM, it's, it's way, way cheaper. So Dag, this is Dave Vellante. So it sounds like you're, you're using the flash as an extension of main memory to give you a persistent layer. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's correct. So um, we're using uh, uh, our, our key value store uh, software um, is called Aerospike. And what they do with, with, uh, with this key value store is that they, they store the actual indices, so the, 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 the indices of the keys, they store those in RAM. Um, and then they store all the data on SSDs. So this means that uh, the indices are, of course, uh, a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than the actual data. Uh, so it's less, it requires less RAM, and it's, it's faster to start up. Um, but then the data is actually always stored on the SSDs and will never be cached in RAM. Um, and this turns out to be very, very predictable in terms of performance. So every single read that we do that is not, uh, or any read that we do for a key that actually exists, will always hit the SSD 
Um, and as you know, uh, the, the access time of SSDs are really, really good, so as in very, very small. Um, so this, the combination of using RAM for indices and, and SSDs for the actual storage turns out to be a very, very performance solution. Great, okay, and, and, and so you're saying that the AeroSpike database uh, is exploiting that architecture in a particular way that makes it, um, I guess, uh, consistent performance and judging on your earlier statements from the cost of RAM, more, more, much more cost effective, presumably. Yeah, it's more cost effective and it's easier to scale in terms of hardware. So um, if you, let's say you start out with, with uh, let's say you want, you want to provision your service with 64 gigs of RAM, which is a fairly sizable RAM amount, but if, if you need, if you need um, uh, two terabytes of storage, that's going to run you a lot of servers right there. Um, and the, the problem with, with RAM-based solutions and in combination with the access patterns that we are seeing is that we, we don't really have any inherent caching heuristic that we can apply. Um, all the, the, the 1.5 billion devices that we see, they can occur at any time. Um, of course, there are some heuristics such as if, if, if you have a page that's loaded and it has five ads on it, then it's likely we'll see five requests and we will access the same device five times. But but other than that, we're seeing like we're seeing reads across our entire key space at, at all times. So a caching solution is is not really that effective. Um, what, what will happen is that your cache will be very quickly will be will be uh, saturated, and then you'll start hitting your storage. And if your storage is not as fast as your, <laughs> I mean, so on a, on a rotational drive, you can get access times now down to maybe the three four milliseconds or so. But you're still limited by, the, by that, uh, which means that even if you have multiple heads and your drives and so on, you're still, you still have a very, very hard physical limit on how many reads you can do. Um, so the problem with these RAM plus rotational drive solutions is typically that once you're, you start getting a lot of cache misses, your performance is just going to drop completely off a cliff. Um, and the only way to kind of um, work or resolve that is by adding more servers with more RAM um, but again, 64 gigabytes is not a lot of, of storage, so adding a new server for every 64, of course, very inefficient. You can add then more and more RAM, but that will require you to get more and more expensive hardware to go with the RAM sticks. So it's just, it's, it's um, cost-wise, cost it's, it's um, way more cost-efficient to use SSDs. And um, again, compared to the, the predictability of knowing that every value that is being fetched will always have the the worst case performing characteristic, which is hitting this, the persistent drive, is, is very, very convenient, especially when you have these very, very hard SLAs that we do. We have to respond within a certain amount of time, otherwise we're going to um, cause trouble for the, for, the, for the website that is running the ads. So, so the performance criterion is predictability and consistent performance, not necessarily the, the top end performance, is that right? Yeah, so that, that's right. Um, if you have a pure RAM-based solution, then you will definitely have uh, the potential to have lower um, average, maybe even, uh, well, it depends on the actual pattern, but you can have lower response times. Uh, but using the, SS, the RAM and SSD solution will give you a very, very predictable response time. Okay, and, and you mentioned before the, the wear issue of flash. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Is that a major concern of yours? How are you dealing with that? Are you just kind of, you know, is the business case such that you can just just burn through the stuff and keep replacing it because you're, you know, your your clients are you're able to monetize the data? Can you just uh, elucidate yeah. us a little bit? So uh, I'm not an expert on on um, the the SSD or SSD where, but uh, I know that there are there are certain access patterns. Um, so basically, if you if you have a very hot spot in your on your storage, let's say, uh, an index file in a traditional database. You have, you have a certain area of the drive that is consistently being uh, read and written to, then you're going to have uh, more wear on that specific area. Um, and then there are certain softwares that, that um, uh, techniques that can be applied that will more, more evenly spread the wear out over across the SSD. Um, so Aerospike has this built in. Uh, it actually doesn't use, it uses the, the um, SSD drives as block devices. It doesn't care, it doesn't have a file system on them. It, it does everything like on the device raw, and that includes uh, wear and tear um, protection. Um, I know that, I, I think I saw um, 
that actually Twitter had a patch to MySQL that did something similar for, for their own uh, fork of MySQL. But th there, are, there are some well-known techniques to avoid that kind of tear um, on the drives. Um, we, we, we use the, the Aerospike solution for this, um, and um, we haven't had any issues yet. We've been running with the same SSDs now for, for a year and a half, so we're expecting some to fail soon. Um, but if you can do a year and a half, uh, on each drive, then that's, you can probably do more than that, but for us, that's easily, we could easily replace all of them now and, and still have uh, great value out of this. This is at the very core of our system, so uh, for us to replace a couple of SSDs every year, um, that's not a big deal, um, and SSDs are dropping dramatically in price. So, going back to the, uh, the RAM question just for a second, there are uh, servers that can take you up to, I think, 512 gigabytes these days of RAM. We do a terabyte, yeah. A terabyte, yes. Um, why, uh, why isn't that a solution with fewer servers? Um, so that, that would probably, it, it, is, it, is, a, uh, it is a solution. Um, but again, the, the price, I mean, I mean, you have to look at, uh, I can't really quote any prices, but the price for a terabyte, uh, first the server class hardware that can, can accept the terabyte is, is pretty expensive. And then and getting the, the, the chips or the, the sticks of RAM that will uh, give you up to a terabyte, it's, it's going to be a very, very expensive solution. It's, it's the traditional scale up um, kind of situation. Uh, the problem is still, the one I mentioned about getting this data into RAM is still going to be a problem. So if you have a single server, let's say you do two then for fault tolerance, let's say you could fit your data in a terabyte of, of, of RAM. If you bring a server online and it has a terabyte of, of um, rotational disks uh, backing this, you're still going to have to read a terabyte of, of uh, data into RAM before the entire uh, data set is hot, so to say. And as I, again, as I mentioned earlier, to us, we don't have any heuristics that will say this 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 section of the of the data set will be less frequently accessed. So you start loading this other data set. Um, if, and if we did if we did caching and loading into RAM only on demand, that would mean that we would have abysmal performance for the first I don't know how quickly we can go through. Um, but it, it would have a significant startup time. So, um, yeah. but there is there is certainly uh, the performance would probably have been. Um, at least latency per request would be lower um, in RAM um, until you start hitting uh, like about the, the limits of uh, the network adapter and so on, which you, you very quickly do when you have these kinds of, of uh, volumes. I, I was also wondering whether in, when you got to very large RAM, uh, you mentioned that, that, you were, that there's very little uh, locality of reference um, within within your uh, within your key uh, pairs so would that also mean that the larger the ram the less uh, the, the more the l l1 and l2 caches would get um, get overwhelmed and then the performance starts to drop that way um so uh, the definitely um i mean if you if you compare um so, so at, at, at some point, your, your RAM bus will probably become a bottleneck as well. Um, and um, if, you, if you're on one huge machine, um, then possibly, uh, de depending on the access, access patterns and depending on the architecture of the server and so on, this is kind of, um, this is not uh, something you can be, be very black and white about. but. But definitely, the, the caching part of the, the use of the CPU to, uh, caches and so on can become an issue. Uh, the reason we chatted about this earlier was because um, there was a, a blog post made by one of the Aerospike engineers about how you can can set up a, a single machine to do a million requests per second. Um, and part of the, the tuning there was actually pinning individual Ethernet ports uh, two individual um, dies on the, uh, sorry, individual cores on the actual physical CPU dies to make sure that that the uh, the caches were used in the most efficient manner and so on. But this is this is beyond what we're doing. Um, but it's definitely um, an interesting topic, specifically now that we have uh, we're in a in a in a period of time where where um, the multi-core 
uh, CPU uh, revolution has just barely started, but in just a couple of weeks ago now, Intel finally announced their Knight's Corner um, core processor series, which is basically a 50 core uh, processor. And and what you want, really want to, to leverage the, the the CPU caches on these kinds of, of server hardware uh, going forward. Um, for us, uh, for our key value stores, this has not been something that we've been looking into tuning, but I'm sure this is going to be an interesting area of, of uh, research going forward. So can, okay, thanks. Can you give um, some, some, go ahead. Uh, oh, hi, so yeah, um, I, I was wondering if we could turn uh, for a moment to the, um, you know, the actual use paper a little bit more and maybe dig into some of the details, uh, the, the actual process. Maybe you could walk us through a little bit, in a little bit more detail um, you know, what actually happens when, you know, device, the user logs on to a certain device, um, what exactly uh, occurs in terms of the back end, in terms of communicating with the, uh, the advertisers who are bidding, what that kind of system look like, um, you know, and, and maybe for those, particularly those people who are not that familiar with ad tech, um, you know, how, how does that, how does that what, what does the kind of architecture look like in, uh, in terms of how you connect with the, the actual advertisers, maybe digging also to the, to the analytics piece, the, um, sure. the types of analytics you're running on, on the data. Yeah. So um, the the request chain of of an ad being served it typically starts in, in the in the user's browser uh, by um, the fact that the, the the publisher has a script include or an iframe on their page that loads the URL that points at some some sort of advertising technology company. Um, for us specifically, this can either be something that we're serving directly off of our servers, or in many cases, it can be something that is is served through what we call an ad exchange. And I, I guess I can spend a little bit of time looking at that model first, because the ad exchange model is something that has become more and more um, prevalent in the ad tech industry over the last few years. So basically, um, the the browser requests uh, an ad unit to, from from an ad exchange to back the server, and this ad exchange doesn't necessarily or usually doesn't have any direct advertiser relationships on its own. But what it does, it actually broadcasts the information about the the device cookie ID, typically that they they're seeing. Um, they might have the IP address. They might have the, an ID for the site, they might have some keywords about the, on the page the, the, that uh, is currently loading and so on. And they pass all that information back to, um, to multiple parties that are willing to, to potentially buy this single ad impression. And this is what we call an, 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 a one-off auction. So basically every buyer, potential buyer, then looks through um, its campaigns that it has running and the other data complementing the data that was passed through from the ad exchange and comes up, makes a decision for how much they're willing to pay for, for this specific ad unit. So in our case, um, for what we call, um, uh, if we look at a, a performance-based advertising campaign, so uh, what, by performance-based I mean a campaign that has a certain um, end goal that we want to achieve for the advertiser, and that can be signing up for some sort of online service, making a purchase, uh, or visiting a site, or, or whatever. The, go the goal can, can, can be pretty much anything. Um, and they associate a, a target value to that, so let's say we're driving, if you go back to the auto industry uh, example, then the goal might be to, to get the user to um, that auto company's online car configurator or um, submit for, for a test drive, for instance. So we have a monetary value on, on each of those actions. And what our system then does is it takes, um, it takes all the uh, attributes or features, as we call them, from the, the ad unit itself. So what, what, what site is it on, uh, what size is it, what time is it, um, where, what geography is this user in, and so on. And then it complements this with attributes that we load from our data store, which might be what other sites that we've seen this user on, have they visited the advertiser site before, um, what other types of devices do they have, have they had any other behavior on uh, and, and a device associated with it, and so on. And then we have uh, machine learning algorithms that, that are used for predictively uh, or for predicting the the probability that this specific ad unit will result uh, at some point in that user doing what we wanted to. So, uh, and then the bid that is placed is actually based on the probability. So we have a target goal value, and we have what the the, the machine learning models, the probabilistic models, are expecting 
uh, the probability of the event happening, and they basically make a bid back to the ad exchange based on that. And then the ad exchange um, will review all the bids that it got in from the different potential buyers, and the winner is the one that places the ad. So that's that's one kind of um, full request cycle. And that whole chain so, lasts um, 100 milliseconds or less. Is that right? That whole chain is a, that whole chain is 100 milliseconds or or less. Yes. So that's a typically 100 uh, 100 milliseconds, and that includes all the hops. So if we're if we're running this through an ad exchange, it means that we will have somewhere between 50 to 80 milliseconds, maybe. Uh, so, so you mentioned, for instance, that the advertiser often will have a, you know, they'll have a, uh, they'll be running a program and they'll have certain targets in mind. Um, and you'll run you your odds whether to help determine, help them determine the odds that the person, uh, you know, will, will reach one of those targets. So you do that for each adverti potential advertiser, which is, a, you know, a customized type of analytics against all this data for each advertiser each time uh, there's a request. Do I understand yeah. that right? And not only for every single advertiser, but also for so an advertiser might have multiple campaigns running in the system, and the the, the campaign might have multiple targeting strategies uh, associated with it. So um, there are, and they, these might have different targeting constraints, but they also have, might have different goals uh, depending on how the the campaign is set up. So um, basically, every single um, targeting line in the system. Uh, makes the decision about how much they're willing to pay for this individual um, ad request. So if it's outside of the targeting, the answer is very simply no. They're not going to pay anything. If it's, a, if it's a machine learning backed model and it, the targeting matches, then the model will be applied to the features that we have uh, gotten from. So combine the, the stuff that is sent from the ad exchange or from the browser. Uh, it's it complemented with the with the features that we have in our data stores, and that is applied to make a prediction and then an, a, a bid value. Um, but every single um, applicable buying strategy in the system will place a bid in, in, in our. This is how, how our system is built. And there's nothing predefined about it. There's, there's not no static predefined values here. It's all done in real time dynamically. Well, that's impressive. I wonder, maybe, could you put it in perspective a little bit? I mean, what what did this um, sector of this market look like even, you know, just three or four or five years ago? Um, you know, how has this kind of evolved from uh, the way advertising was done kind of at the, at the dawn of the web uh, through the early 2000s until now? It sounds like it, it must have been quite a, quite a revolution to reach the point where we are, uh, we're at now with the type of use cases and uh, uh, applications you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so um, first of all, I mean, TapAd is now two years old, approximately, and we've been fortunate that we <laughs> weren't the first uh, company that tried to do this. So, so the technology such as SSDs and software such as uh, Aerospike was available to us. We didn't have to build it from scratch and try to figure it out ourselves. So we're very, we're very fortunate. But yes, definitely, the, the ad tech space has evolved uh, significantly over the last five, six years. So. Um, if you go five, six years back, then, then um, the, from the advertiser perspective, it was mostly non-data-driven, or well, it's not correct to say data-driven and not data-driven, but you, would, you will be able to set up targeting tactics or constraints targeting a certain type of browser in a certain ba state, for instance, based on IP uh, lookup. Uh, you could say something about, I want to target sites which have these kinds of keywords and so on and so forth, but pretty, pretty predefined statically, um, pre yeah, predefined things. Um, now, with the with the um, advent of what we call audience buying, retargeting, and behavioral um, based uh, targeting, uh, it changes the picture quite a bit. Um, there, there's a wide range of, I guess, sophistication um, and the amount of dynamicism that is in based in or that is available in these these real time buying systems, but um, for us, as I said, everything we do uh, is based on the decisions um, that are or rules that are being applied onto the data as we see the bid request and or as we see the ad request coming in. Um, and uh, the only reason why we're able to do this is well, a it's due to these storage solutions that allows us to to retrieve information. Um, at the scale and at the, 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 the latencies that we require. But it's also about modern CPU architectures 
and um, having um, very high high speed multi core um, uh, server hardware that allows us to do these kind of things. If we if we just started a couple of years before, then the hardware costs involved with, with building out a solution like this would have been a lot more expensive. Um, and this even supersedes, I would think, actually uh, Moore's law here because um, just the the uh, access to to affordable gigabit Ethernet and and, and 10 gigabit um, routing equipment and so on is it's just something that has become so much, much cheaper over the last few years. Outside of the ad tech industry, where do, where do you see technology like Aerospikes being applied? What 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 kind of applications make sense for a NoSQL approach? Um, so, I mean, the, the the basic idea of a key value store, um, it, it, it's a very simple abstraction. Um, and therefore, it can be applied in, 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 in many areas. I, I would not ditch uh, the traditional data stores. I mean, we're running MySQL servers as well because they're really good at many things. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to replace uh, anything that it would, would fit in a relational database with any kind of NoSQL solution. For, for that's for us, for one. Um, but. I, this specifically, uh, key value stores such as Aerospike, uh, they lend themselves very well to, to data sets where you, you are looking at specific IDs. You don't have to query. You don't need secondary indices. Uh, I know Aerospike is actually working on that, um, but, but that, that's, not, um, that's not currently in there. But you, you, just want, you want to have something like a memcached. I guess that's a, a memcached is um, uh, almost equivalent to what you can do with Aerospike, except that uh, an Aerospike is, is um, uh, persistent, it supports transactions, and it's, uh, it's um, uh, more fault-tolerant um, and redundant. Um, so I don't know, <clears throat> the use cases, there are many, many use cases, and there are also things you can build on top of key value stores. So you can build other types of uh, analytics engine based on a very, very solid storage engine, which basically is what Aerospike is right now. I know, again, they, they are working on some other uh, more advanced analytics features on top of that um, based on a system called Alchemy DB. Um, I'm not very familiar with that, but uh, that will definitely um, broaden the range of uh, applicable use cases for, for the system. But Anywhere where you're using memcached and you would like to have the data persisted, I would say that, that uh, Aerospike is a good fit. I want to make sure that we have time for, uh, for, we've got quite a few people online here with us. Uh, make sure uh, people have a chance to ask any questions. Should let people know too, you can tweet us. Uh, I'm at D Vellante, at Wikibon. And we'll uh, get your tweets online, your questions there. Um, before we take a few questions, Mr. Chap, just wanted to jump in. I mean, some you know, use cases that come to mind are really, really any any data-driven real-time bidding process. So that could be that could be applicable to the utilities industry, um, certainly uh, to the financial services industry. Um, you know, just two use cases off the top of my head that I can see where this type of technology would be uh, certainly very useful. Where you don't have the, uh, it's not it's not just the scale, but really the the performance and the the time. Uh, given to make a decision uh, is sub-second. Um, so, you know, there's certainly beyond uh, ad tech, there's definitely some, some possibilities I can pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, this is David Fly. I'd, I'd like to ask what, uh, what your, who your competitors are and um, uh, what do you need to do uh, to be competitive with them? Obviously, Google comes to mind. <clears throat> so, who tap ads competitors are? Yes. Um, well, that's a very <laughs> open-ended question. Um, so, so uh, I mean, our, we work with publishers and we work with, with advertisers. And um, currently, the offering that we are providing is is uh, unique in the in the market space. So, we're not competitive. We're not competing head to head right now with someone offering the exact same product as we are. Um, but there are there are. There are definitely uh, players, as you mentioned. I mean, anyone that has a lot of, of cross-platform audience information. You know, I mean, you have Google, as you mentioned. You have Facebook, who we do work with. Um, but um, 
I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to call out specific uh, companies, no. Uh, but in general, anyone that tries to maximize value for advertisers, they're, 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 we're competing with them. Uh, we have an offering that we feel very strongly about. We'll, uh, we'll increase the value to advertisers, and, and, and we also feel very strongly about this, this holistic approach to, to, to looking at um, users as they're moving across multiple devices and providing analytics on how, uh, let's say, ad impressions on a mobile device may affect uh, users signing up for a service on their tablet at a later point that day, for instance. Those kinds of, of analytics are, we, we feel very strong that that is the right way to go about advertising in the coming decade. You, you've mentioned cost, you've mentioned ease of scaling. Um, uh, what are the what are the biggest dri and you've mentioned performance um, what are the biggest drivers for your decision and how fast are you having to scale so um, the decision was uh, made um, about a year and a half ago now um, we had been running uh, a couple of of other key value stores uh, one based on the JVM so uh, based on the Java virtual machine, and one based on the Erlang uh, ecosystem. And they both had, had pretty um, good performing characteristics, um, but had, well, when I say good, they're fast, but Aerospike is actually still like several, uh, several times faster. But um, the, the main, main difference was actually how we were able to to do a failover efficiently and adding nodes to the cluster without having any 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 problems uh, with re rebalancing the cluster. That was the problem we were seeing with the other solution that we were running, is that when we were testing things, um, adding a node or having a node fail and then ha adding a new one and having them rebalance, repartition the data, it worked fine when we were testing it, but then we actually had to do it in real life production and we had issues with it. Um, and um, uh, we took a little gamble. We trusted that Aerospike would, would help us if we ran into any issues like that. We, we haven't had any issues with rebalancing at all. We have actually had um, several servers fail at the same time, um, not due to hardware error, but due to human error, as in unplugging the wrong equipment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we have also increased the capacity of our, of our server our cluster uh, a couple of times over the last year and a half. And it has been working really well. Um, I think one of the, the architectural smart decisions that were made um, is that the, the client is actually uh, not a very thin client. Uh, it, it tries to do, it is aware of all the nodes in the cluster and it will be aware of the latency that is associated with each node in the cluster and it can, there, it can use that for routing traffic. Um, but it's not a pure client-based routing. It also has so during a rebalancing, so when your, your data is moving or partitions are moving be between the nodes in the server and in the cluster, the nodes themselves will actually also reroute traffic uh, so they can function as proxies. So you, you kind of have fault tolerance both in the client driver and also in the servers themselves. So it is a very, very stable um, client uh, to server system. Um, and we had very, very few issues with it. Um. Can you give us some si uh, some uh, sense of the size of the infrastructure there? I mean, how, how many terabytes or the, of, of data you're you're dealing with? Sure. So um, we're currently running um, five of these citrus leaf uh, citrus leaf nodes, um, and each each server has uh, I think yeah, we, have, we have six uh, 120 gigabyte uh, drives. So a total size of 3.6 terabyte of, of data. Um, now that is uh, replicated um, with, a, with a fault or a K factor of one, which basically means that we can afford to lose one node without losing any data. Or may, sorry, maybe it's actually, no, it's two. We can lose two nodes. So it means that um, so we have a certain uh, redundancy of the data, which means that we're not storing a full, our, our data set, if we extracted it, wouldn't be a full 3.6 terabytes. And of course, we're, we're also um, over-provisioned in terms of storage. But I would say that the, the total data set is maybe somewhere in the um, a terabyte and a half area or something like that. So it's not huge. 
although maybe in the world of databases it is. No. Um, just a reminder for those who are, uh, I'll try figuring out who's got the piano going in the background, but yeah. if you could mute your line, if you're not speaking, that'd be great. That's gone. Okay. It was nice, though. Yeah. Thank you. It was nice so, piano. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, if you compare this data set to what, what the kind of data sizes that you're looking for, you're looking at, if you're looking at more tabular data sets that are used for um, like analytics processing, and, you know, like a Hadoop cluster or something, the one terabyte is not, an, uh, it's not a lot. But if you're looking at um, uh, a data store that actually enables you to access this one point, whatever I said, well, there's more than one terabyte of data in less than a millisecond, including the network network trip time around it, then that's something very different. And this very is not, right. I mean, th this, this system, this key value store is not a analytics database. I mean, it's not, you can compare this to something like uh, Natiza or Vertica or um, Hadoop uh, file store, right, or HDFS. It's not like that at all. This is about having this data accessible in a very, very low latency, high throughput way. So it's uh, you will need, and we 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 use um, big data analytics solutions as well as like for for doing database uh, analytics, and that's not what we use use um, uh, Aerospike for. That being said, we are we are we are now able to do a lot of the the, the processing and, and algorithms that we run. We are we can do them as we are processing a request instead of having to pre-compute them um, using an Hadoop cluster because we have access to this data um, and all of it uh, in a very, very low latency fashion. Yeah, I think that's a really important uh, point uh, to make that this is, you know, this, we're talking about a big time, uh, real time transactional application versus some of the type of end user analytics uh, that are often thought of when we think of big data analytics. Um, you know, kind of returning to that question, both the the RAM versus flash question. Um, you know, you, you laid out very um, eloquently why this uh, the the approach that Aerospike takes uh, is appropriate for this kind of workload. What is your take on for more analytic type workloads? Uh, does, does that paradigm apply, or do you know RAM uh, focused databases uh, that don't employ flash? Uh, are those appropriate for those types of use cases? What's your take on, 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 on that? So for, you're asking specifically about more um, traditional analytics, so counting right, so we, and, and aggregating things, right? Right, so we're seeing things, you know, like SAP HANA, for instance, um, which is, is uh, you know, also SAP uh, says can support transactional applications, but we're seeing a lot of more kind of end user analytics on that. Is that something you think that's a, a viable, uh, solution for that more end user analytics or does, does the flash equation still, still come into play? Uh, so, sorry, can you re repeat the first part of the question? Well, just just curious, you know, the, the, the architecture you laid out and the way Aerospike uh, uses SSDs uh, yep. in conjunction with RAM uh, versus just RAM only, um, oh. whereas we're seeing some memory databases on the more end user analytics side that don't employ flash. Or, or hmm. SSDs. So, just just wondering, is that is, is that an open, a reasonable approach in your opinion, or or does Flash also have a role to play in, in more of those end user type analytics? Uh, in cases? So, um, I mean, if if you're looking at a uh, more traditional RDMS type uh, of application or database, so let's say MySQL or Postgres or, or a Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle, then then I think that that SSD is probably there. They will increase the performance of your applications in many many cases. Um, when you're talking about more so the big data solutions, so um, either uh, proprietary solutions such as uh, Vertica or Netiza, uh, well, Netiza is actually out of question because they don't have hardware, but uh, any of the, the, the big analytics engines and or like uh, Hadoop um, and MapReduce built on top of Hadoop on HDFS, then usually your applications will actually be uh, CPU bound more than, than they will be IO bound. Or, Actually, usually is wrong, um, but in many cases they might be. So, uh, a, a rotational dr drive, for instance, can have very, very high um, bandwidth when it comes to reading data sequentially. Um, SSDs are actually not that great at having. Well, they're fast, but uh, compared to due to the the cost per mega uh, megabytes read off of disk per second in a linear fashion, then you might get a long way um, by using rotational drives. Um, and for a lot of these, for a lot of the big data queries, the analytics queries that are being run, like you want to you want to count the number of unique users that have visited your site, or you want to you want to uh, sum up the number of 
um, age views or whatever, those kinds of analytics, then you typically you're, you're sifting through a linear data set and you're, you're doing groupings and so on, on on the fly as you're going through a data set. And um, I think that rotational drives with, with high capacity and, 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 and traditional RAID setups will actually, um, I, I think they will live on for a while longer before they get completely overtaken by SSDs, just because they're, they actually lend themselves very well to that. For smaller data sets where you want one more random access, then SSDs are definitely uh, a good thing. Doug, we've got a question from uh, Brian uh, came in through Twitter. Said He said, uh, he asked, could the matching optimizations and multi-platform identification be applied to massive social gaming? To massive social gaming? Um, well, uh, I'm sure that that uh, gaming uh, or anything that is high volume will have a lot of the similar things. So, um, I mean, it all depends on what kind of data you need to have have in order to make decisions. I mean, um, if you're doing if you're updating uh, user inventory somehow, or I mean. It, <laughs> My store of weapons and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't it's know. a tough question, but yeah. anything that, is, that needs Million. access, <laughs> random access to a lot of data and very quickly <laughs> will probably be at least applicable for this. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. I, I, we, we've had some, some folks on in the past who are in that space, and, uh, and, and I, I know they analyze a lot of the uh, kills and stuff like that. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'd like to go back, if I may, to, to you, what you were mentioning before, that you were doing some analytics in real time. Um, could you describe that a little bit more? Because this is, is I, from what I understand, a little bit more than just a transactional system. You're doing uh, mm -hmm. real time an analytics to decide things. Could you uh, talk a little bit more about what those analytics are and the, and the limitations of them uh, and things you might want to do in the future to expand that? Mm. So uh, not just analytics, but in terms of the logic that we can apply. So typically, if you, if you wanted to, um, in a more um, traditional older, old school way, <laughs> I'm saying that old school, um, if you wanted to, to um, uh, let's say, implement uh, a frequency cap, uh, which is what we call, we, we, we use this for, for um, uh, when we, well, you don't want to show the ad too many times to a single user, for instance. Uh, and, and typically, if, you're not, if you don't have access to a, to a solution like this, then you could either you could use the cookie store of the, the device to say, okay, I've shown you a number of ads, now we're going to stop that. But that, that kind of bloats the, the cookie store of the, of the device a lot. And in many cases, you won't have the access to that. But instead, uh, you would have to just store the, the, the ad impression log, and then you would have to go back on a, like an hourly basis or something and run a batch offline job counting how many users have been exposed to this ad and how many are above this threshold, and then put that in somewhere um, and make that actable in the next decision. Whereas if we're, when we have access to the real-time data store, we can actually just, just, when we see an impression coming in, we can store that on that device immediately and when we see another ad request coming in from that device in the same millisecond even, we will already be aware immediately that, that this device has now capped out. So that's just the, the kind of logic that I was, was mentioning when I said we, there are things we can do in real time. When it comes to um, analytics, um, we are not actually using uh, the Aerospike platform as much for analytics that we might uh, have been able to. So for well, instance, well, what I meant was uh, additional uh, analytics of the type you just mentioned, you know, expanding, bringing forward uh, into this platform, things you might do into this platform is what I meant. Uh, oh, yeah, than yeah. Pure analytics. Uh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we have a lot of these kinds of, uh, of uh, situations. For instance, we're working with a lot of other ad networks, and um, what we do is we call uh, multi or cross device uh, attribution reporting, which basically means that if we are working with a, with a mobile ad network that is showing ads to um, to, to, through this mobile app, for instance, uh, and then they are they are tracking the impressions of those ads through our system, so we're storing in this in impression history, and then at, at some later point in time, uh, we see that user um, on a different device, but that is associated with this device that the other ad network showed an ad to, um, and we will we will see that that user actually sign up for an, for a service, then as that request comes into us. 
the notification that the user signed up for a service, then we will immediately have access to all the ad impressions that led up to that, what we call it, conversion, so the user actually doing something. <laughs> um, and, um, and we will be able to, to pull out the impression history, figure out exactly which partners we worked with that were actually were participating in building up to this event happening, and we will call them out immediately. So we don't have to go back again. Uh, the alternative approach to this would be to, to have a, like a nightly batch job that went through all the conversion events and try to line them up with the impression history and then calling them out. But we can do all these things in real time because we have the read and the write uh, access to this data uh, continuously, which makes some things much simpler, um, and um, uh, it's, it's a big game. But in terms of analytics, there are some interesting cases. We're using Redis for a lot of our real-time analytics um, because it supports um, these, um, it has these primitives for, for counters and bit operations and so on. Uh, the problem with Redis is that it's purely RAM-based. Um, Aerospike has, in the last few months, actually gained um, support for, for things like atomic counters and so on, which makes it more interesting you know, for using for more pure pure analytics. So, I mean, there's a lot of, of uh, a lot of interest these days in in stream processing and doing real time uh, analytics based on stream uh, stream processing. And to do stream processing efficiently, you need to store the results of those streams, uh, or, or the results of those analytics. And putting that into a, a real-time type database or data store, I don't like the word database here, but a data store such as Aerospike or Redis or some other key value based store that supports um, uh, atomic um, operations like uh, like increments or even bit operations, that's something that be, will be very, very valuable going forward, I think. So, uh, and if I understand it correctly, the, the, the real value of this is that you can change the weightings and change the uh, uh, the bid algorithms, or the, the results of the bid algorithms in real time uh, as, as as things are developing. Is that, is that yeah. Uh, so well, both the, the actual the bidding algorithms themselves, they will, will, because they're looking at the data in real time they, and looking at the data that is there exactly at that point in time, they will immediately, for a single device, the, the second that device has been tagged or added some sort of uh, attribute to it that will be relevant for the decision making, next second, um, that data will be part of the decision making. So. Doug, it's John MacArthur. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this is very interesting. What I'm hearing a little bit is uh, a proliferation of databases, not a consolidation around any single database. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and 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 really optimized for specific use cases. Um, is that a fair summary? Yes, uh, yeah. I think that's a very very important uh, thing to realize is that there is no the reason for the the growth of the NoSQL solutions is because there are certain uh, use cases and usage patterns where specific types of architectures lend themselves very well. Uh, and if you want to to cope with the with the with the scale um, and the growth that you have with a lot of the the, the modern um, services that are provided to users now, you have to not just use a single solution. Like you can't just buy an Oracle machine or a cluster of Oracle servers and then you're, you're done. You actually have to to look at what your your use case is, what the access patterns are, what your scaling needs are, um, and then uh, use. A number of different technologies. I, I don't think you should use overuse and have your whole system end up with like a, a quagmire of, of fragmented technologies. That's not definitely not a good idea. But trying to apply one thing for for all the data patterns uh, is, is not a good idea. Yeah. Again, Doug, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, also, thanks to David Floor, <laughs> Dave Vellante, uh, to Brian, and and to Jeff uh, from the airport. I uh, appreciate you uh, dialing in and for your questions and comments today. Uh, just a reminder, we'll have um, uh, six research notes up uh, later this week uh, discussing various aspects of what we learned from today's call. Um, this is a, we are publishing on a wiki, so feel free, and Doug, this goes to you as well, feel free to hit the edit button if, and, uh, and correct, enhance, or improve the, the documents. Uh, We'll send out, uh, I'll send out to you a list of the documents as they're published. Um, uh, we'll also have a podcast of this uh, research meeting up on the Wikibon site and on YouTube um, uh, uh, this later this week. 
Uh, thanks again for joining us and, uh, and uh, watch the upcoming Peer Insights uh, page for future Peer Insights. Thanks very much. Take Thank care. You. Thanks, Doug. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Woo, toasty in here.